Okay. Uh, uh, dear uh, audience, uh, dear friends, uh, dear comrades uh, in India, in Germany, and all around the world, uh, I want to uh, welcome you to our online meeting, uh, Shackled Trade Unions, Weak Labor Standards, Resisting in India and Germany, which is hosted by Berlin for India and Gruppe Arbeiterinnen Macht. The immediate cause and reason for us to organize this meeting itself is of a major, I think, political importance, obviously for the working class, for the masses in India, but I think also globally. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, India's parliament has actually passed three uh, legal codes on labor. It has actually tightened and scrapped uh, labor rights and uh, replaced a number of federal laws and, la uh, and therefore made an attack on the labor code using, if you want, the pandemic, dramatic health crisis affecting millions and millions of people in India all around the world. But I think the other reason about this is that we have also organized the meeting not to address these so anti-working class, anti-popular um, attacks, but also we have uh, introduced this meeting because on the 26th of November, we will also see mass resistance by the Indian trade unions, by working class uh, against these laws with a hopefully uh, million strong mass general strike uh, for on that day. Uh, and before we are going to introduce our speakers and the format of our panel, I want to express our solidarity and support for the upcoming strike and hope it will be a starting point for a mass united fight back against the tax on labor rights, the capitalist offensive and the BGP government. Uh, as we will see when we also address the issues of facing German working class and trade unionists, we will see a number of similarities. We will also see that also here, bosses, governments are trying to use the pandemic for also pursuing their own interest. But we will also see obviously a lot of differences in the conditions uh, uh, in the current situation. We will clearly see that, uh, you know, working class people, the poor in countries like India, uh, in those who have experienced decades, in actually centuries, also of imperialist oppression and plunder, face a quite different and even harsher situation than those in the capitalist heartlands in Europe or the uh, United States. Uh, but obviously, where we will address the differences and similarities, uh, the focus of this meeting at towards the end obviously shall also be what are the conditions under which we struggle? What are the policies? What are the demands? What are the forms of organization necessary in order to fight back? Uh, and what can be a way to unify this struggle in the countries where we are, but beyond the countries and national boundaries, so that we actually have a global fight back against the capitalist offensive and the current pandemic? I don't want to... Uh, elaborate too much. I'm going, myself is, my name is Martin Suchanek. I'm going to chair the meeting and I want to confine myself to chairing it in the next uh, two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, before we start, I want to welcome and briefly introduce the speakers. We have got A.R. Sindhu. Uh, she is secretary of the Center of Indian trade unions, uh, and she's going to speak as a first speaker on the questions, what kind of barriers, what obstacles do we face in organizing strikes, in, organi in uh, organizing collective action and bargaining in India? Uh, and in a second round, obviously, we will also deal with the question how we can overcome those ob obstacles. Uh, the second speaker will be Matthias Fritz. He is an activist in Arbeitskreis Internationalismus of IG Metall Berlin. Uh, IG Metall is the 
Metal Workers Union uh, and also in the network of class struggling trade unions in Germany. Uh, unfortunately, his camera is not working, so you see there's also backwardness in Germany in terms of the facilities we got, uh, but uh, uh, we obviously are happy to uh, listen to Matthias' contribution. Uh, like uh, A.R. Sindhu, he will deal uh, with the specificities of barriers to organizing fightbacks and strikes in uh, countries like Germany, um, and also what collective bargaining means under the current conditions. The third speaker, uh, which will be Kota Modi, uh, he is the General Secretary of the New Trade Union Initiative in India, uh, and he will speak uh, and address questions, what are the effects on informal work, on contract work, under these conditions, which, you know, actually the majority of the Indian labor force is facing in one way or the other. What does this mean for the struggle for social security and protection in India uh, and uh, beyond? Um, uh, and uh, uh, so that's uh, the contribution Gotta Modi will do. The fourth speaker will be Michael Fürterer, he works for Transnational Information Exchange, or the abbreviation TAI network, which is an international network for organizing trade union solidarity globally, which has a long existence over the last years and actually decades. Uh, and he will deal with the question of uh, how the current situation is actually facing workers, particular who are sort of out of the normal, in inverted commas, work contracts, who face non-regular work and precarity throughout Europe. Uh, so that will be uh, his main thing. And how does the crisis affect those workers? But also, what does it mean for their conditions to fight back? Are they only victims or actually also people who can uh, um, uh, uh, resist? Uh, the final... Uh, speaker will be uh, Maitri Krishna, uh, a labor law expert who works for the All Indian Central Council of Trade Unions. Uh, and uh, the last speech will also be there to address the question, uh, how can actually labor standards be enforced in India through uh, uh, labor inspection, uh, what kind of role do trade unions, do workers' organizations need to play in this? And obviously, how can we achieve that? Uh, in the first round, the speakers will introduce on the subjects for about uh, eight minutes. Um, uh, then there will be a second round where we will address the question how our resistance can be organized. And then there will also be a possibility for all those listening via YouTube or Facebook uh, for actually contributing to the discussion by, uh, ask, by using the chat function, raising questions either to all the speakers or to individual speakers. Uh, I want to ask all those people, try to be brief in your questions uh, we are, uh, so that we can take as many as possible and have a, a broad range of discussion and issues. So thank you very much uh, for listening to the discussion, for all those who are online in India, Germany, and globally. And I want to actually uh, uh, hand over to the first speaker, A.R. Uh, AR Sindhu. Again, she is the trade union uh, secretary. And uh, she will or discuss on the uh, speak on the question of uh, how to overcome barriers for organizations. Uh, just uh, before we start, uh, the, it's important that uh, people go to the uh, website of uh, Berlin for India org uh, live, which is also I think uh, link uh, on the on the placard for the meeting. Uh, and post uh, their questions there. They should not use uh, 
if possible, YouTube and Facebook for that. Uh, but I guess we can put the link uh, so that they uh, actually know this uh, on the, the platforms too. Uh, so, uh, sorry, that was just for the comments. Uh, and I therefore want to hand over to A.R. Hindu, and I'm happy <coughs> that uh, she actually is part of our meeting and uh, uh, will uh, address the question of uh, uh, collective organizing strikes under the current conditions. Are you? Thank you, Comrade Martin. Is it audible? Uh, yes, it's fine. Uh, first of all, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, revolutionary greetings to the uh, audience in Germany, India, and uh, various parts of the world. Um, uh, on behalf of the trade unions in India, uh, the title which is given to me, and I and also I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Berlin for India, for inviting us to. Uh, speak on this so important subject. Uh, first of all, when we are uh, talking, uh, organizing this program in the context of the All India General Strike uh, called by the trade unions in India uh, on 26th of November, and it's going to be a grand success, and it's the uh, second general strike in this year itself. And within the seven months of the pandemic and the lockdown, we could uh, we we were able to organize this strike and declare this strike. So, and if we are talking about the uh, problems in uh, organizing strikes and uh, the subject is that barriers to organizing strikes and collective bargaining in India. I would like to say the background in which this uh, Particularly after this pandemic, there is a drastic changes in the entire uh, governance, governance system. There is a total restructuring of the governance in economic, political and social aspects of it. And it's going to be the Indian uh, government is going to be a total authoritarian and fascistic way. And this is also this the changes in the labor laws or the uh, passing of the labor codes is one part of that, the overall project of the overall authority. So here uh, they have, uh, the government has passed all four labor codes. One labor code was passed earlier and this during this uh, pandemic period in the parliament, uh, bypassing even the democratic process of the parliament, they have passed this three labor courts and also they have passed some uh, the basic change uh, uh, laws are making basic changes in the uh, farming system also so these two together is going to take away the rights of the working people as a whole the peasantry the agriculture workers and also the working class so the basic rights have been taken away for the eight hour work the right to uh, form association and collective bargaining and also the right to minimum wages all the basic rights of the working people has been taken away and also in the farm sector the basic rights of having uh, owning the land and the to so or the to cultivate whatever according to their will and also to have a right to uh, of uh, selling it according to their uh, convenience or and having a minimum uh, price for their produce this all also been done away with whatever minimum uh, existing legal provisions have been done away with and if you are speaking on uh, about the uh, right to form associations and collective bargaining there are some drastic changes made in the labor laws so one is that there was uh, the the, the pro there was a protection for the workers for forming a, an association. Uh, 
they while they have applied for uh, registration they could not be removed from job or they could not be made uh, means uh, conspire in, in uh, into some cases like uh, of of conspiracy against the uh, management or uh, something like that that protection legal protection was there for the workers to form an association that has been taken away and for the collective bargaining rights also and also there is a new provision added for deregistration of the trade unions so this is a big uh, threat to the entire collective bargaining process and freedom of association and the workers and there is a change in the uh, permanent employment pattern also it is the, the it is be, become so precarious and there is a fixed time employment and so the workers will be eager to how uh, to know means they are uh, always under threat that they whether they are going to continue with their job so there is no, no job security so the uh, if there is a threat to take away the rights of the workers uh, to form the association that is there and that legal protection is no more there and also there is a uh, threat for taking away the uh, uh, registration itself so this is these are some of the changes i am not going into the technical details of all these things and there is there there in other ways also the they have changed the definition of the workers and even in the four courts you can see the uh, definition of a worker will vary so there will be very less people who will be coming under the uh, definition of a worker itself in many of these courts and in addition to that the coverage of the uh, labor laws that also has been uh, removed from a vast number of uh, working people even in the organized sector so the um, there is a provision that and the layoffs and the uh, closing of the uh, companies also has been uh, now the number of uh, coverage of the um, companies that has been uh, uh, removed from almost 70% of the uh, institution or the, the um, factories or the industrial uh, units so 74% uh, of the workforce and 70% of the uh, industrial uh, units have been taken away from the uh, protection from the layoffs so this is these are the even in the uh, definition itself they have taken away the right of the workers from the uh, protection of the uh, labor laws in uh, addition of addition to that the implementation mechanism also is has been weakened in uh, uh, such a way that there won't be anybody means even approaching the implementation mechanism and there is a, a big uh, open authority given to the administration to make any drastic changes in the uh, existing whatever limited uh, provisions are there for the uh, right of the workers that also yet appropriate government or even the uh, with an executive order these definitions also can be changed such drastic changes are made in the uh, legal system the existing system itself so this is uh, all, also it is going to be not only affecting the workers and their working condition and this entire process is going to affect the entire democratic process and the democratic system of the country without uh, uh, the working class having the basic democratic right of the eight hour work and minimum wages and the uh, or freedom of association and collective bargaining no bourgeois democracy even can exist you can see that the entire democracy the bourgeois democracy in the world has been emerged out of the struggle of the working class and also of the peasantry uh, in the slogans of the um, uh, eight hour work and the right of uh, collective uh, bargaining and freedom of association and also for the um, uh, right to the Uh, right for the land to the tiller so these are the basic rights of the working people if that is not there the no democracy can sustain and in india the federal structure also has been uh, 
at peril and all uh, th that also in the uh, in, in india's uh, constitutional uh, structure also in the federal structure the uh, right of the states has been taken away legally also the totally there is an authoritarian and the concentration of uh, centralization of power is uh, taking place in the country in this context so it is very important not only to uh, protect the right of the worker uh, as such but to protect the constitution the protect the democratic system of the country uh, it is very important to uh, form a build a resistant movement in the country so in that context it is uh, the working class as united it was continuously in the from 1991 onwards this effort was been made but during this pandemic uh, in the uh, lockdown period because uh, the uh, pandemic act and the disaster management act and the article 144 restricting the movement of the people everything is in place so in that uh, situation this act has been acts not only this act so many other changes has been uh, taken uh, place in this country so here the working class also is at the same time building up the resistance i think that that uh, portion will be coming up in uh, the next rounds how we are uh, building up but uh, at the same time only one point i would like to say that here the resistance part also the working class and the peasantry are also coming together in this resistance so there is uh, 26 november the strike the peasantry is also jo joining us as a rural hartal or the rural uh, closed down band so this is also one of the qualitative changes in the resistance movement also. I think the, for the first round, I can uh, finish here and then if the, uh, I can uh, come again in the second round. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, and the next speaker will be Matthias Ritz. Uh, he will speak on the problems facing working class uh, organizing during the pandemic, uh, the, uh, organizing strikes, collective bargaining. As you will know, we are not near having a general strike in Germany, uh, but uh, I think Matthias will address the difficulties we face, but also how we can uh, build up a movement. Matthias. Yeah, hello to everyone uh, on the panel and uh, listening. And I'm especially happy to meet again Gautam, who gave me an insight in the situation of India on a visit eight years ago. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, the problems, the, or the attacks that the working class in Germany is facing uh, during this pandemic are far from such attacks as uh, you have in India. The direct attacks by the uh, companies is uh, rather on a minor scale. They uh, extend the use of home office with, without um, any regulations or they um, stop uh, asking uh, works councils and trade unions for their comments on introduction of security rights or so. Uh, but of course there is a trying especially in industrial sector also very much in metal industry um, and in and in, in trade uh, retail trade to lay, lay off to close shops to lay off um, people and to reallocate the uh, production into what they call locust countries and under these conditions uh, these uh, attacks can be done, of course, easier. Uh, but what is to be addressed as the main problem uh, of the working class in Germany is that in this pandemic, the uh, major trade unions in the trade union confederation, DGB, German uh, Trade Union Federation have uh, turned even more uh, to a collaboration with the government and with the employers. 
this meant especially now for the uh, for the wage dispute in public service, which just ended, that um, which was started with a demand of a wage rise of 4.8 percent for one year, ended with something that goes from yeah three to eight percent over a time from eight years. For, of three years, over a period of three years, and is very much specified into different um, sectors. For the majority of the workers, it means that they will stay near or uh, under the rate of the expected rate of inflation. So, uh, and on the other side, in the, on the other hand, the trade unions in, in the industrial sector. That is a metal, IG Metall, metal trade union and a chemical trade union. Already last year postponed their negotiations, and uh, and are making offers to the employers' associations that uh, have more the aim to regulate. Uh, the problems of production, of industrial production, uh, in the interest of the companies, um, like offering to work less for less money, less hours for less money, and similar offers. We have to see what the outcome is. But uh, the, the um, IG Metall, as largest trade union, um, deliberately choose to to postpone the cancellation of the running contract, which means, according to labor legislation in Germany, that in this period they can't even uh, do warning strikes, but will, do, will reduce the whole um, conflict, if you can even call it a conflict, to negotiations of goodwill with the other side. So. Behind that is, uh, of course, the interest of these um, trade unions, which are led by social democrats, and if not by social democrats, then by members of other parties that um, support this major line of the social democratic uh, trade union leadership, to uh, not to uh, put up too high demands on the public institutions in case of the public service union and not so there is more money to spend on saving the economy just to give you an example uh, the money given to uh, the german airline lufthansa to or to somehow get through the crisis is uh, almost twice as high as all the additional money they give to uh, hundred thousands of uh, workers in public services for the next three years. Uh, and in case of the industrial union, uh, the concept is to defend uh, the German status as an exporting, as a, one of the major importing nations uh, in, on the globe um, in co uh, competition with the US, with China and uh, of course with the other European partners, so-called partners. So uh, that what would uh, be necessary in this pandemic to uh, to, def de to attack uh, the the capitalist class and the and the the, the rich to. Uh, for the sake of not letting the working class pay for the pandemic, um, it uh, it seems that they subordinate all the interests of the of the working class under the demands uh, of uh, of the le leading capitalist sectors. So the question is not. In Germany at the moment, that you have a major that we have a major attack from the government, but that there is a big 
national, how to say, collaboration, unification of the uh, different forces, which of course in the end will be to the ben benefit of the capitalists and uh, not of the working class. Uh, still, there is of course unrest coming with so many uh, companies under the threat of uh, of um, of sacking workers, closing uh, sites, and on the other hand, uh, people being um, not satisfied with the um, agreements that have been made. So it will be the question that the whether the, the left, whether the more militant sectors of the working class will be able to, um, to start struggles from the ground, from the grassroot, and fight, uh, uh, including a fight that the trade unions defend the rights of the workers instead of uh, seeking deals on the green table with the employers or with the state bureaucracy. Thank you, thank you so far. Uh, thank you, Matthias, uh, <coughs> for your uh, contribution. Uh, the next uh, speaker will be uh, Gautam uh, Modi. I hope I pronounced the names uh, correctly. Or, uh, he is uh, General Secretary of the EU Trade Union Initiative, and he will deal with an important aspect of the uh, uh, working class in India facing the whole question of contract work of the informal sector and of social, uh, therefore the struggle for social protection against overexploitation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to uh, Berlin for India for uh, organizing this uh, program and of course for inviting me uh, to speak this evening. Also greetings from the NTY and all other comrades from the Indian trade union movement to the working class and comrades and friends in Germany and elsewhere in the world. I do see uh, in the Facebook chat a comrade from Pakistan and I do want to particularly greet uh, friends and comrades uh, and trade unions in Pakistan. Uh, you know, I'll join with my comrade uh, from the CITU, Sindhu, in saying that what's an attack is fundamentally an attack on democracy. And at the base of that, in all of what's being sought to be changed in terms of the labor laws, is an attack on the right to form and join unions, an attack on the right of trade unions to exist and function, uh, an attack above all aimed at criminalizing the working class, pushing them out of the legal form of the trade union, pushing them into, into extra legal forms. Uh, 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 uh. And perhaps, Nothing brings that out more than what is really the attack on workers who are, I wouldn't say in the informal sector, but all workers, whether employed in the formal sector or in the informal sector, but who, who do not have regular employment contracts. Um, and this is most of all, I think articulated in the laws by with the introduction of uh, fixed term employment. Uh, India will now um, join uh, with those that have fixed term employment laws, uh, most notably uh, Cambodia and Laos. India potentially has laws worse than Cambodia or Laos. India now has a fixed term contract law that has no minimum time of contract. So effectively, a worker could be employed on a daily basis on a contract. So effectively, your letter of employment is also your letter of termination within this arrangement. Uh, even if you have the most robust trade union laws in the country, 
hypothetically that is, uh, if you were employed on a daily contract, um, it would be very hard for you to join a union and agitate your demands. And any protection offered under fixed term contracts that the government claims in the law actually uh, really becomes zero when uh, you realize that you can have a one day contract. I mean, it's a very, I mean, I think we all understand within the working class and in the trade union, most of all, that we cannot, we cannot stabilize a membership unless there is some stability in the employment contract. If it, the employment contract is from one day to the next, then this is truly free for all. And that's really, I think, a situation today. India has entered a phase uh, where it's in effect free from labor rights. Capital has won the greatest freedom uh, 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 perhaps um, amongst the 10, 12, 15 largest economies in the world in India, uh, where it's truly free for all. Uh, you know, the, 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 the core of an authoritarian regime that tends to being fascist, and we don't need to teach our German comrades about that, is that the regime actually takes away from some and tells others who didn't have it that, look, now you will have it. Uh, so, and it then claims a politics of uh, uh, a universality. Uh, I, I think this is most important when we look at what's what they're doing with social security laws. The claim is that what 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 the working class did not get in seventy years was universal social security. They will get now. And how are they going to get it? We're going to get it by actually taking away benefits that existed, that were protected by law, that were defined by parliament, that could only be touched by parliament, to an entire process of rulemaking that has been taken away from the hands of parliament and passed into the hands of the executive. So that, in a sense, is the, is the, is the crucial change that's, that's, that, that's coming about where uh, the executive can make changes arbitrarily and laws that were protected ultimately by parliament are no longer protected by parliament, but really uh, open to the vagaries of the executive, the civil service and the political class. Um, to give you really, you know, much is being made, for instance, of India's new law for gig workers or app-based workers. But the entire system is based on workers having to register uh, uh, in contrast employers will not be checked or audited for their social security contributions but they can self certify their social security contributions so this you know epitomizes in our understanding um, uh, uh, the sheer imbalance or inequality where workers have to comply with a system, they have to chase that system, they have to register in that system, and employers, on the other hand, stand apart and say, this is what we owe workers, this is what we owe the government. I mean, I think finally we're, just to wind up with the one thought, if anybody thought and I say this expressly speaking to German comrades, since these ideas came out of the Austro-Hungarian empire, led most notably by, by Frederick Hayek. If anybody believed that capitalism needed democracy, they were so wrong. And of course, our German comrades know that better than anyone else on this planet. We are today at the cusp in India and elsewhere in the world where capitalism has recognized that democracy is actually a cost it has to bear. And what we're witnessing in terms of the labor laws and in terms of just about every other democratic rights in India is that democracy is not a price capitalism is any longer willing to bear. Thank you very much.
Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much uh, for the contribution. Uh, we will move to our fourth speaker, uh, Michael uh, Fütterer. He works for Transnational um, Information Exchange Network, called TAI, and he will deal with the question of non-regular precarious work in Europe, but also how this, uh, uh, you know, how to address the problems facing working people um, uh, thrown into that uh, here. Uh, Michael. Thank you, um, comrades. And uh, again, also from my side, thank you to the organizers of the discussion and welcome to the audience. Um, of course, precarity did not start with the pandemic, but was a widespread problem before uh, in many countries in Europe. Um, I would like to give examples from the retail sector, since our network works with uh, retail workers from Spain, from France, from Germany and Italy, um, to give an understanding what precarity in these sectors mean and also how in the current pandemic and COVID crisis, um, these problems increased. So in all the precarious sectors, especially in retail, the common problems are, of course, low wages, um, which make workers, even if they work, dependent on additional unemployment benefits. And uh, there is a widespread phenomenon which is linked to that, which is part-time work and uh, minimum hour contracts. So this would mean that, uh, for example, an H&M worker in Germany, uh, she would have a weekly contract which guarantees her 10 hours of work and she would have to ask for more, which means uh, that she's like dependent, even more dependent on the company, on her immediate supervisor to grant her additional hours to make ends meet. So you have a pre very precarious low wage situation in retail and this is a problem not just in Germany, but also in Spain, France, Italy, and in other countries. So, for example, our comrades from Madrid, from Zara in Spain, they tell us that they are simply not able to afford an apartment in Madrid because the rents are so high and the wages are so low. Um, the low wages are not the only problem when it comes to precarity. There are flexible shift systems, which means that workers are called for work on demand. Um, when and where the company needs them. So if you look at Esprit, which is a, a well-known retailer here in Germany, um, they employ workers not just in one store, but they it can happen that in the morning the workers get called and he or she is told to work in a completely different store because the company needs worker in that store. So um, you have a work on demand, very flexible shift systems. And over the last years, we have also seen uh, and it is also an, an aspect of precarity that there was a reduction of workforce, but at the same time, the amount of work has stayed the same. So the results were an increased workload, increased work intensification, which led to increased health problems um, of workers in precarious working conditions. And in addition to that, and we see that especially in retail, uh, there is a strong anti-union and anti-works council um, strategy of the companies. So. The companies, they try to prevent workers from forming unions. They try to prevent workers from firm forming works councils. Sometimes it's very open union busting, like trying to dismiss workers who want to form a works council or want to form the unions. But sometimes it's also more subtle, like an, an argument that uh, the companies, especially in retail, do very often is that they say, OK, works council is too expensive because uh, then the costs for the particular store increase and then it's no longer profitable and therefore it has to be closed. So there are very different strategies by the companies to, yeah, to attack or to prevent workers from unionizing. So these were the aspects of precarity that have been there even before uh, the COVID pandemic and similar like this, you will find it in different precarious industries. Um, since the pandemic has started or since the COVID crisis has started, uh, we have seen actually in retail lots of attacks on workers. So, for example, all the non-permanent workers have basically lost their jobs. So all, all the workers with, with fixed term contracts lost their jobs. And also those workers who had a, 
an increase in working hours for, I don't know, if you have, a, for example, a part-time contract which with 20 hours a week, sometimes these workers have an fixed term contract for additional five hours or 10 hours a week and all these contracts have been terminated so there also has been um a loss in income since the since the COVID crisis in retail sector and of course health problems have increased not just because uh, workers have to maintain hygiene measures and have to do additional work to maintain hygiene measures but also uh, because of the job loss because of the cuts in the workforce um, but at the same time, since the stores have reopened, um, the workload is basically the same like before, but there are less workers in the stores. So um, we also see store closures. And the interesting is, and this brings me to the broader dy dynamic that underlies this increase in precarity, is that if you look at store closures, um, retail companies, and the most famous one which does this is Inditex or Zara, um, a Spanish retailer, they close stores even though they are profitable. And they close stores because they have a different idea for retail. And this is linked to restructuring of the industry that is happening during the current crisis and restructuring that has started before but is now accelerated, uh, which uh, in retail has a, lot of, uh, has a lot to do with digitization of uh, the retail industry. So. Um, we have seen in the last years, and uh, it has, as I said, accelerated during the current crisis, that new technologies are introduced um, in the retail sector. So basically what companies try to do is to create, through the um, introduction of new technologies, a complete new retail trade. So they have new store concepts, they reorganize work, which um, usually means for the workers more monotonous work, more stressful work, and also a change in the entire work organization. And this is possible uh, with new technologies that the companies in the retail sector try to, to implement. And uh, this has accelerated during the crisis. You can, you can see the example of the Swedish retailer IKEA. Um, the, the, the management of IKEA they announced during the crisis that in the three months of store closures or two months of store closures, they have accomplished um, the entire digitization processes they had planned for to accomplish in the next three years. And there is a trend that is happening um, in the pandemic, which has started before of reorganizing or restructuring the entire industries. Um, yeah, which is a and which leads to, to new forms of control for the workers. So for example, um, with the introduction of new technologies in the retail sector, it is possible for managers who are not inside the store to call workers and ask, hey, why is this task not done yet? Or why has it, been, has it not been done yet? What are you doing? Why are, not, why are you not doing your work? So this, is, this becomes more and more possible. Um, it becomes more and more possible to uh, to include contract work more easily and to outsource to improve or increase the precarity. So there are a lot of new problems coming up um, under the current crisis, which are linked to the restructuring of the industry. And um, maybe to add one point, which would bring us to the second question about what to do and what strategies are. Um, in the me meantime, it's not only about restructuring of the retail and logistics sector here, but uh, Inditex, and they are the biggest example for it, so one has to look what they are doing. They have uh, announced that they want to invest 3 billion euros in the digitization of their entire supply chain from the stores until production. And they want to, to reorganize, or they want to use the current crisis to reorganize the entire value chain from stores to logistics to production, and which, uh, yeah, raises the question of international solidarity completely different because it's no longer support for individual struggles, but actually to develop ways to yeah fight on these things together. Yeah, maybe that's the introduction. Okay, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, the last speaker in the first round uh, will be uh, Maitri Krishnan. Uh, uh, she's a labor law expert working for the All India Central Council of 
trade unions. Uh, and uh, the question obviously she's going to address is how to enforce uh, labor standards in India through labor inspectorate, through the, uh, the actions of unions. I, how can we not only get uh, uh, labor legislation in place, but also how to actually enforce it? Um, uh, Maitre, your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers for uh, actually having this uh, uh, conversation today. Because I think uh, now more than ever, it's this conversation has is, is so important. Given where the India stands and, and the fascist government that we presently have and the lessons that we really have to learn from uh, Germany. I'll speak about the, in, in terms of what, uh, what uh, enforcement mechanisms have changed and, and what implications that would have. The importance of... Uh, the, the importance of enforcement mechanisms is uh, that much more important in the in, in India in India, given that the uh, history of labor legislations and the manner in which this has taken place would show that the it was never an intent to really allow for the strengthening of unions or the strengthening of workers. So what was really imagined that there would be a, a labor law a labor legislations where the government would actually play the role of the enforcer. And, and, and therefore, the protection of the rights of workers became so much dependent on the enforcement machinery that, that, that exists. So if we, so this is uh, all the more important, uh, given that India has more than 93% of its workforce in the unorganized sector, which is where unionizing is specifically disincentivized and is in, in many ways discouraged. So given that the enforcement mechanism through its inspection systems becomes very important to really uh, ensure the enforcement of the most basic of laws including laws like the minimum wages act the ensuring of the payment of wages act and and the and laws that protect and ensure safety mechanisms in industry in various industries so it is in that context that we really need to look at the manner in which the uh, inspection system has been steadily dismantled and by the, with the coming of the courts pretty much destroyed so if we, uh, the dismantling of the system is something that has been taking place for a long time now. There is a bogey of the, of inspections actually being against the, uh, uh, being against business and, 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 and the creation of an inspection rat, so to speak, which, uh, which comes in the way of business. But if one really looks at it, it, uh, what becomes apparent is that the, the enforcement mechanism, including inspection, is something that has always been some uh, that has always been something that has left much to ask for. In fact, a, a report that came out in 2018 or so said that two thirds of the of the of people in the unorganized workforce and one of every three Indian workers did not get the minimum wage of about rupees 375 a day, and that is something that is indicative of the failure of the enforcement mechanism. The number of industrial accidents that have taken place over the years. In fact, there is a report that talks about industrial accidents that have taken place between 2014 and 17. There are about 8,000 accidents and more than 6,000 workers have died. This is again a failure of the enforcement system. So it is in that context where we already have uh, a system that is not that is not functioning as it should. That this these courts actually look at breaking and dismantling down what is all what is what the minimum that is even there. So the uh, India is, is 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 has ratified the uh, the the ILO convention on uh, on the ILO labor inspection Conve uh, inspectors convention, and if we look at what the changes that have been brought in, it is it is more than apparent that there is a complete flouting and violation of the uh, of the convention itself. So now there are no longer inspectors who are required to enforce the law. What you have are so-called inspector come facilitators. The inspection system, which is premised on the fact on, on the power of the inspector to actually conduct surprise inspections, that has been severely watered down. And now we now the inspection system that has been um, imagined is one where the government is going to decide who will which inspector will go where when and uh, based on a randomized selection. The uh, the the uh, method of uh, of the, the powers of the inspector to even initiate action has been severely curtailed. So what we're really saying is that the state as a, in this imagined role as an enforcer is no longer there at all. 
and um, given this has to also be seen in the context of all the other laws which have pretty much effectively uh, uh, have dismantled the right to organize have uh, assault, uh, have uh, have placed a direct assault on the on unionizing and the powers of unions see uh, uh, in fact if we really look at it on one hand we have a system where uh, an enforcement mechanism of inspections which has been severely watered down by the new codes that have come in on the other hand what we have is the um, is the policing of unions that is taking place by by these codes which which uh, in fact the one of the, the the industrial relations code which allows for deregistration and cancellation of registration of unions for violation of any of uh, any any portion of that code at all so something like what is deemed to be an illegal strike could result in the uh, re deregistration of a union and this is happening while on the other hand you are allowing for the employer to uh, to sort of have a free for all this also needs to be seen in the context of the fact that the, the the unorganized workforce has been increased by these com the coming of the courts what the courts have done has is in fact to uh, to exclude large number of workers from the ambit of various laws whether it's laws that protect and regulate contract workers whether it's the law that regulate and protect factories and establishments so it actually has brought large number of workers outside the ambit so you have a you have you have a huge spurt and growth in the unorganized workforce by virtue of the fact that these courts actually uh, keep them outside uh, outside the scope of the protection of the law and on the other hand you have an inspect you have an enforcement mechanism which has all but been destroyed so what we're really seeing is effectively uh, sort of um, the dictatorship of the employer that has come into force and all of this uh will really have to be seen in the larger context of what is happening in the country itself so uh, like was spoken earlier the uh, what we are saying is not merely it's not merely a, a revision of labor laws it's not it is a it's, it is a destruction of uh, the rights of workers that has existed so far it is in, it is an assault on the constitution it is an assault on on all democratic processes that exist and um, and core democratic values if we really look at it uh i would just like to end uh, by uh, remembering i mean and uh, speaking about uh, uh one person because today we are speaking about uh, resistance in 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 today's times and this is in this is the uh, indian state's answer to any resistance that is that we see in the in in the state today and uh, the person that i like to speak to uh, i would like to just speak about is um, Sudha Bharadwaj she is an active she is a trade unionist and an advocate for um, for workers for for adivasis in the state of chatisgarh in india and she has been in prison from august 2018 and that is the way in which any form of resistance is actually being met by the state and that's something that is and that's something that we really need to take cognizance of when we speak about the uh, destruction of the working class the um, the uh, the manner in which the there's a complete assault on the working class by the state itself and so what we have and and sudha bharadwaj has been in prison from 2018 august without any trial and for a crime that did not even get there was for no crime so to speak so that is the state in which we are uh, in which we presently are so the challenge before us is uh, certainly very very real it's um, it's a challenge that is that has been put not only to the working class it's a challenge that has been put to democratic principles itself and is something that will certainly need to be fought for um, in all uh, methods possible thank you uh, thank you very much uh, for the uh, first round uh, to all the uh, speakers uh, we are now coming to a second round where obviously we can deal more with the question of resistance with the question of strategy what kind of organization what kind of demands uh, do we need uh, the round shall be around, will obviously have uh, four to five minutes per each speaker uh, so that uh, you know we can also address questions from the audience there have been some already been uh, raised in the chat function uh, and uh, therefore i would ask uh, uh, AR Sindhu to 
come up with the first speaker. Uh, in your introduction, you uh, made the point that the current struggle for labor rights is actually also a struggle uh, of uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the not, uh, it's not only a struggle of the workers, but it's also uh, combined with struggles from the peasantry. I think there was also a question from the audience, how does it link with the uh, question of women's struggles and their situation? But I think it was also the important point that is also a struggle for democratic rights and actually for the defense of, so to say, <coughs> democracy against the uh, 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 Modi government and against the uh, uh, um, move towards dictatorship uh, and uh, fascism. And therefore, my question would actually be, and uh, how uh, do you think this, uh, these struggles link up with each other? Uh, what kind of, uh, how can this be brought into a movement which, you know, takes on the demands of the working people, workers, peasants, the, the poor, and how, on the other hand, it can actually uh, also challenge the state uh, or the current state uh, attacks, because that seems to me a strategic one. And in the course of this, there was a question also raised uh, to you, but also to Gautam, uh, is uh, how do you uh, analyze the agenda of the Hindu chauvinists of uh, uh, Hindutva and the BGP in that context? Uh, I know this is a broad range of questions, but uh, uh, maybe you can uh, address them when we speak about strategy. And I hand over to A.R. Sindhu. So, Actually, during the last uh, few years, this uh, unity of the trade unions that has come up in a very big way. So the last uh, few years, even the ruling party, uh, the BMS was uh, once a part of the joint trade union platform and all. But more than that, even when they left the trade union platform, the workers' unity is continuing in many sectors, particularly in the organized sector, it is very visible also. So the, uh, through the years of struggles and campaigns and going to the people, we could achieve a kind of a unity at the uh, trade union unity, you can say. We cannot say, I mean, uh, totally as a working class unity as such, but it's coming up in that way. The Then uh, this uh, crucial question of the uh, unity of the workers and peasantry here last two three strikes we, we have seen but this strike it has uh, come up uh, in a very uh, comprehensive way the platforms of the farmers organizations and agriculture workers organization and the platforms and the other uh, uh, of the trade unions have come together to give this uh, general strike uh, as a unified uh, strike so this is and the demands also we can see that these are all the basic demands for the people and the revival of the economy and to have uh, the basic amenities for the people it's not and it's at the same time that trade unions demands one of the major demand is for the withdrawal of the labor codes as well as the uh, farm acts so this is one of the major things and during the even during the pandemic even as early in in july itself we have seen uh, magnificent strikes also actions in different sectors and major organized sector strikes were against the privatization of the national public sector you know, companies and public uh, assets so this is one, uh, uh, special one I, I would like to mention is the coal sector strike. Then there was uh, the petroleum sector, the PPSEL, they were have a strike. And in one of the states in India, Uttar Pradesh, where the BJP uh, is in most authoritarian way there, uh, there was a strike by the electricity workers and that was a total strike. and 
they could uh, uh, make the government withdraw the privatization of the electricity in the states. So these and in the unorganized sector also, the, there was uh, so many uh, struggles and strikes happening even through the uh, throughout the pandemic period as well. Uh, there, the struggles of the uh, frontline workers in the health sector. The, there is a special category of, you can say, a kind of, kind of contract workers, which who are even not recognized as workers. The scheme workers, the uh, health sector workers, the Anganwadi workers, the ASHA workers, they call in health sector and the primary uh, nutrition care sectors. So these workers, are, they are totally women workers. Their struggles also. And they also forced many of the governments, the state uh, governments, provincial governments, to increase even in their wages this even during this period the struggles are coming up and the crucial question of their streams coming together this is one of the major aspects of the farmers and the um, workers the working class and the peasantry coming together that is a great uh, achievement and this has to go further and even in the uh, during this period, even in the political lane also, on some of the major political parties, they have to change their positions, at least for the means uh, sake of speaking, whether they will be standing by it or not, that we, we, the history has to tell. But some of the parties, even one of the allies of the ruling uh, the coalition of the bjp in the central the center they have come out of their coalition and they supported the especially the farmer struggles so this is one of the uh, things which this unity and the people coming out on the streets are coming up but uh, still a long way is there to go and especially one question here came up regarding the hindutva agenda of the bjp and all the BJP uh, Hindutva agenda and the labor law, it is it's very much in connection with. Because to have this regime, this authoritarian regime, they want to have such a fascistic party with such an ideology. So it's very much suitable for the ruling classes, the BJP and the Hindutva ideology of the RSS. So they are means complementing each other and helping each other. They are one of the crucial question of the social issues and the, the entire uh, um, effort of the RSS in the social uh, trying to uh, make debates on communal and the India's uh, special racism. This is the caste question also. They are this entire Manuvad, uh, what we call the RSS ideology, the BJP's ideology of the particularly the working people, the Shudras, they are against that. And it is reflected in the social oppression, which is means many times it manifested uh, of the class oppression itself. So there also there is has to be a, um, an effort made by the entire society to uh, have the connection, the linkage of this uh, social oppression, uh, particularly of the Dalits with the scheduled caste, what we call uh, in India, their uh, struggles it has to be linked with the class struggles on uh, questions of wage and land and all. So that is one of the crucial uh, challenges in the coming days, I think, that to, uh, uh, how uh, we have to take up. And in one question, sir, that also that that regarding the uh, women workers, I think Maitre would be able to explain much. But the home workers, the domestic workers, what we call, they are totally out of the view of the uh, working uh, means the labor laws. They claim that they are including everybody, but they are out of view of the labor law. They are not there in the definition of the workers or in the workplace. Uh, definition it is not there and even other sectors like the scheme workers such as i mentioned they are also not there at all there in the uh, labor laws and also they are taking away many of the protective legislations which is uh, like the night work and all that it was earlier the, um, the workers who were having the protection now they are taking away the protection and telling that you can ask for the protection so these are all the drastic kind of basic changes which they have made Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the uh, contribution and first answers to the questions from the audience. I try to raise those also as the speakers come along. 
the next, I uh, want to ask on the question of strategy and uh, the question of how to organize resistance is Matthias. Uh, in the chat, uh, there have also been a number of questions raised on the role of the uh, more privileged or labor aristocratic workers in the imperialist countries, uh, which uh, and in the global north, um, and how uh, uh, um, we can actually uh, uh, make a break, so to say, the hold of the uh, uh, um, trade union bureaucracy, but also how can we uh, address the problem of the real uh, relative, but nevertheless many privileges which some of those workers uh, um, actually got. Uh, and linked to this, uh, the question, how can we make the trade unions in Germany uh, organizations of class struggle rather than of compromise? Is, uh, I think, was one of the main pieces of your contribution. How can we, you know, make them sort of the organizations who fight against the government and don't look for national consensus all the time? Um, uh, and I think uh, that would be an important point, uh, which I want to ask uh, Matthias at that stage. Obviously, other speakers can then also come in to those. Matthias. I, yeah, I'm not sure whether we can only say that the labor aristocracy is confined to the imperialist countries or to the north, as you say, unpolitically. Uh, one of my experiences I made in India, uh, seeing there already this very large informal sector and um, um, contract workers and so had uh, to my short uh, insight also the effect that the that there is a small labor aristocracy in such companies as uh, Mercedes Benz just the same as it is in Germany even though this uh, layer is uh, is uh, much smaller in number and um, it was interesting to see that they are were very much interested on the conditions of the workers in Germany and comparing themselves with them and the benefits they get, which they also wanted, and were much more much less interested in the question how can um, the unions organize uh, also in India a solidarity between um contract workers and uh, workers with a with a permanent or, and permanent uh, the, the permanent workforce yeah just uh, uh, which we as uh, members of uh, uh, trade union left uh, on the other hand were confronted with the situation that we saw india as a as the future for for Germany and other imperialist countries with that very large and wide uh, workforce without rights. We now have the situation, of course, I think, in the global level, that the uh, that under the pressure of the capitalist growing capitalist competition and the need of capital to higher exploitation. There are also attacks on the um, labor aristocracy. Uh, for example, in the German based industry, uh, where they are, have been forced in the last 15 years to give, um, to give backs, to, to work longer without pay or uh, with less pay or that new workers coming in f getting uh, permanent contracts do that on a lower base than their colleagues that have been working in for longer years so the there is an, an ongoing general struggle about this question what is are the rights of the 
uh, of these uh, contract workers coming from contract companies. And it is sad to say that in general the, the trade unions in Germany have sought to um, give a few more rights to these contract workers and maybe a bit higher rise of pay, uh, higher wages, uh, additional benefits. Um, only by that creating uh, uh, intermediate layers, but not. Uh, coming back to the old demand uh, of the trade union movement that all workers in one workplace should have the same rights and same uh, wage um, scales, um, wage paying scale system or so, yeah. Uh, one un one, one uh, company, one union, one uh, organization that has uh, long been lost. So, of course, this the same problem ex applies to the division of labor internationally. Uh, uh, to it, it is sad to see that uh, also trade unions and works council leaders have sort of agreed in in the in the relocation of uh, of uh, of so to say uh, ease simple work into other countries. Uh, to make their own companies, uh, which are of course not their companies, more competitive and uh, by and trying to save jobs by that for the rest of the workforce. That is of course poison for solidarity and poison for organization and poison for international um, solidarity. Um, there is a strong understanding in left trade unionists of any political uh, conviction that this is bad and has to be uh, fought against but uh, we also have to say that uh, it is uh, it has been difficult it is difficult and it is very crucial question that now in that situation where capital attacks larger layers of this um, labor aristocracy um, and has to and cannot go for through with uh, just securing the posts for the older workers and losing and not cre creating new or, or not defending the posts but just the social securities for the older workers which was the general strategy of the trade union uh, leadership where uh, capital attacks uh, even uh, threatens to to um, sack uh, larger parts of the labor aristocracy. That this leads to a understanding that this strategy of uh, of adapting to the demands of the capitalists was a dead end for the trade union, and that the focusing of national standards and uh, in in Germany and defending jobs in Germany is is uh, uh, also a dead end towards the uh, uh, the global attacks of the capitalists. Uh, it will of course be uh, necessary for the trade union left in the broadest sense to not only preach that but show in struggles that this is a valid uh, concept and um, we have to do we will have to use every um, opportunity to spread that and i think the idea of uh, showing support to such occasions as the general strike in india is a good uh, occasion to to uh, spread this idea um, yeah, but we have to go on. We have to uh, uh, establish, how to say, stable links between uh, activists in internationally. <coughs> Thank you, Matthias. Um, the next speaker and the second round uh, will be uh, Kautan uh, Modi. Uh, in your uh, introduction, 
you raised the question uh, that democracy uh, is not essential for capitalism. Indeed, uh, that capitalism becomes more and more, <coughs> um, uh, aiming more and more to almost get rid of it. Um, and I think uh, this is an important point for our um, struggles and ideas, because the question is, I think, which I would like to you to maybe link to it, is what does this mean in terms for what what do we then fight for? We obviously need to defend our rights. We need to try to repeal a tax. But on the other hand, there's also the question, you know, how we can actually go, uh, does, uh, how can we go sort of say beyond that? Um, and if we want to defend uh, democratic rights, uh, doesn't this mean also that we need to challenge capitalism itself? Uh, and how does this then link up with the question of uh, labor struggles uh, um, in India, in Germany, and internationally? You know, what, 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 what the present phase of capitalism leaves is no doubt that uh, uh, it's finally, it's in the interest, democracy is what's in the interest of the working class. You cannot have a trade union without democracy. You cannot have a trade union in an undemocratic society. And when we talk about labor aristocracy, yes, I completely agree with Matthias. Uh, labor aristocracy is not the monopoly of imperialist countries. Labor aristocracy, and I would add to the labor aristocracy, every, in all our societies, there are pockets of conservatism within the working class. Just as there are vast reservoirs of militancy, there are pockets of, of conservatism. It is not as if, you know, the German middle class, working class is entirely conservative and the Indian middle working class is entirely militant. Uh, uh, I, want to, I want to give a big shout out to, 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 to uh, uh, vast sections of German workers who have at various times, including in the pandemic, um, uh, some precarious, some very vulnerable workers in, 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 in retail, most notably, who have stood up for workers in India and elsewhere in the global south, in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan. Uh, and, you know, there's a question in the chat about, how, about, about German workers playing a role in the supply chain. I think it's both sides have to play a role in the supply chain. And yes, it's taken us a very long time. Uh, we in the trade union anywhere in the world the working class is under sustained attack but i think there are incremental steps that we're all taking uh, uh, to be able to uh, not just organize but also mobilize and mobilize in solidarity the key to 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 to, to advancing finally uh, in one breath is really solidarity and solidarity among the militant in order to isolate so to speak the conservative section within of the working class within our own um, uh, within our own economies within our own countries, um, and you know that takes me to the question on Hindutva. At the end of the day, Hindutva is the antithesis of class. It's an effort of capital to find to 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 resurrect an only bus so-called. Uh, 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 heterogeneous primordial idea and actually seek to homogenize society with it in terms outside of class and perhaps nothing actually can confirm that more than the way the indian private sector is financing the bjp in a way it has never done before but more than just passing on money the way the Indian private sector is supplicant and subservient to the BJP, the way it never has been ever in its history. I mean, you know, if if if, if India, if independent India had one had 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 a, a, one of India's problems has been that it's had a relatively autonomous bourgeoisie, which has been autonomous of 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 of, of, of government, had a development path that has has gained it a certain space. Or within the uh, with, uh, within global capitalism in order to maneuver with 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 government locally, 
But that's changed with the BJP. And uh, uh, what we're looking at is actually the emergence of the oligarchic capitalism in India uh, at this point. So, so um, and this is really where the question of, 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 of you know, the militant section and the role of the militant section of the working class comes in. It's not just workers for wages. It's not just workers for better working conditions. Yes, that is the core of the struggle. That is the struggle against 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 capital, and that is that that wage struggle is the critic is the key struggle for the share of wages in 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 national product versus versus profits. But that said, the militant section of the working class actually has an enormous responsibility in shoring up the democratic movement. This is, at the end of the day, the only self-financed, self-organized, self-governing democratic section within civil society, so to speak. This is the longest surviving institution within progressive civil society in any of our countries, going back a century in India, a century and a half or two centuries in Europe. And the trade union has, an, has a critical role in the idea of progress, in the idea of rationality, in the scientific advance, all of which can only happen in a democratic society. Uh, uh, and, 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 and part of this advance, I think, is, 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 is solidarity, is a constant growing of our of working class consciousness in order to be able to understand uh, uh, the differences between us. I really would pay a tribute to Matthias uh, for the sharpness with which he, 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 he understood uh, 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 the, the, the stratifications that exist uh, within the Indian working class in a very short visit to India, as he said, eight years ago. Uh, I had forgotten it was eight years ago. But, 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 but I think we have to really analyze where class formation is taking place, which section within us is breaking away towards conservatism. How do we pull that back? And we have to do that in each of our societies in its own, because the struggle against imperialism finally is a struggle between uh, 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 you know, nation states in, defined in the 20th century sense of it. These are struggles we have to build nationally as we really leverage our strength and capacities on a dynamic of solidarity, which uh, really is the um, is 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 uh, solidarity is actually where, where in a sense is the highest form of consciousness where we understand capitalism in its most evolved form in its global form um i'll stop here thank you very much <clears throat> i hand over to uh, michael uh, in your introduction you raised the whole question of restructuring digitalization and actually the speeding up of that process under the corona conditions, if you want. So, I mean, you referred to IKEA and I think there are probably more examples when we have time to uh, in this meeting. Uh, my question would be actually, what do you think are the kind of, therefore the political answers or the trade union answers we need to uh, uh, to, to raise, how does this link actually also to the question of international solidarity? And given the, in a sense, I would say the, the, the fact that we have also quite important and huge chains of production and distribution globally, uh, what does this also mean, for example, for our ability not only to organize with a struggle in one state, but rather for the question of, of organized collective struggle beyond national boundaries. I think there was also a question in the chat addressing that uh, uh, question. Is there the possibility for international strikes, uh, strikes across uh, nation states? Uh, as we know from the history of the labor movement, in a sense it started with that. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> there is a uh, how do you think this can be addressed in, in that uh, situation so that we look at the question of digitalization um, um, uh, uh, precarity not only from the situation of people are getting to, in a worse situation, but also how can they actually 
also utilize this and, and fight back. Yeah, I would like to add to what Gotham said. Um, together with NTUI and its affiliates, we have been building a network for the last, I think, 15 years, um, where we tried to link retail workers from Europe, those retail workers who are working in H&M stores, Primark stores, Zara stores and others, um, with those workers who are producing these garments in South Asia, especially in India and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. And the whole effort of this network that we built together is to, to form an understanding or to build an understanding and class solidarity among the workers in that particular industry and along the value chain. And in these years we, we've been doing this work together, we learned that um, there are a lot of common problems that these workers face, both in retail and garment. Um, and we learned that in meetings of these workers. So we, we facilitated meetings of retail workers and garment workers and retail unionists and garment unionists. And in these meetings, we learned that the problems these workers face, be it low wages, be it harassment, be it the health problems or the work intensification, are common problems and help to, to build a common understanding that we need to fight together and uh, fight together the principal employer, which is basically the transnational retailer. And in these years of, of building solidarity along the value chain, we made some important experiences. And one, like most recently, is, um, and maybe Gautam, you can add to that in another round, um, in an H&M supplier uh, in near Bangalore, which um, which is basically producing 100% for the Swedish retailer and the manufacturer there wanted to retrench all the workers. And there has been a fight going on on the ground against this illegal retrenchment. And at the same time, H&M workers here in Germany and their trade union, they actually organized solidarity activities. Um, they organized direct actions at the shop floor level they engaged in direct negotiations with the management here in Germany to um, organize support for the demands of uh, the trade union on the ground and uh, for the demands of, of the workers on the ground. And I think why this example is important, and this then again brings me back to the issue of restructuring, is that what we were able to do together is like to force H&M into negotiations with the union on the ground. So usually in the garment industry, these retailers, they act in a framework of charity. They say, oh, we are do-gooders and we want to improve everything, blah, blah, blah. And they usually do not commit to anything. And through the struggle on the ground and through the solidarity of the retail workers, we were actually able to force the company into negotiations. And I think this is an example we can build on because um, when we look at the restructuring of the industry that is going to happen in the next, I don't know, five years, or let's not discuss about the exact number of years, but in the next future, um, changes that are going to happen in the retail sector here, um, industries or technologies that are implemented and digital systems that are implemented, they will not only affect uh, how work is organized here in the retail, but actually along the supply chain. And that is basically what retailers such as Inditex want to do. So what they want to do is that for each and every order, they want to decide where to produce, how to ship, how to get the order to the store. So basically what's happening here with that will directly affect the working and living conditions of the working class in India and in other production countries. So we have to um, build on these experiences of joint struggles and solidarity in order to, um, yeah, fight for, for and influence these, uh, these changes. And another moment would be, um, I, I said in the beginning that part of our network are retail workers from Spain, France, Italy, and Germany. And we started like, Two years ago with these workers, like a process to understand these changes um, in the retail industry here. So what I briefly said about monotonous work, about introduction of new technologies. And we engaged with the, with uh, our comrades in retail into in discussion. How do we understand these changes? Because usually, 
and I would say that is that is also a limit of our movement, is that when new technologies are introduced or when work is reorganized, um, we tend to assess the consequences of these technologies only once they are introduced. And we do not say, okay, what is kind of technology or work processes, what do we want? And what are our demands when it comes to the introduction of new uh, technologies or new forms of work? And we understood uh, in that process that we have to develop own criteria and own demands when it comes to um, yeah, restructuring so that it's not in the interest of capital, but that uh, new technologies um, make work maybe easier. So how do we have to, to fight for that? And we, we understood that we have to do this together with our comrades from, from France and retail from, from uh, retail in Spain and Italy. Because if you look at a company like Inditex, they do not, which is the parent company of the well-known retailer Zara, um, when they introduce a technology, they do not introduce it only in Germany. They introduce it in all their stores. So you have to, to fight together and you have to negotiate on the introduction jointly. Otherwise, they will play you off against one another. And what we also understood and did in this um, joint struggle and process is that the whole issue of health gives an access to fight for these uh, demands because health that that's something also we, we we use in our work along the supply chain if you address health problems and understand that these health problems are caused by the work environment you work in then it also helps to build a collective understanding that we actually have to to fight together and and build links between the different workers and the different uh, stages of the supply chain because it has an yeah, uh, it, it unites if you talk about this experience at the workplace, how you suffer from harassment, how this is caused by, by how work is organized and how work is constantly intensified by capital. So um, these are like examples I think we can we can build on and which, which show us that we have to yeah, come to an understanding how we jointly fight, um, how we how we jointly negotiate on these restructuring that is happening in these different industries, and that it's not enough to uh, to do that on the nation state level or the factory level or the plant or store level, but that we have to do that jointly. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I want now to hand over to uh, Maitri. I uh, hope the audio is working uh, at least because I didn't see uh, the, the camera uh, on. <clears throat> the, uh, in your introduction, you also spoke uh, uh, about the whole question of repression in the state uh, and therefore how we defend ourselves against uh, uh, increased uh, uh, um, it, it takes not only on trade unions, but also on individual activists. I think you mentioned a courageous uh, uh, woman who has been in prison for basically fighting for the legal rights, which exist formally. Uh, and I think maybe if you could uh, elaborate a bit on how that uh, links to our struggle. Secondly, I also wanted to ask you whether you could actually uh, answer the um, question which had been raised before uh, on the uh, uh, situation, uh, what do the changes uh, in the labor laws uh, or the, uh, the, 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 the tax mean for uh, uh, women workers and also home workers uh, in India? Thank you. I've just turned off my videos and because my internet seems to be a bit unstable. So I hope I'm clear. The uh, what I just oh, I want, when we talk about repression, I think um, there can be uh, what we have seen over the last few years is that just as much as we need to look at labor laws and the kind of changes that they're actually bringing about to labor legislations and uh, taking uh, taking away the rights of uh, of workers, we'll also uh, need to be equally cautious about the manner in which legislation is actually being brought in to repress various people's movements where and um, and workers and and I had mentioned uh, in my uh, when I had initially spoken about uh, uh, Sudha Bharadwaj who is a lawyer and an activist 
and, and a trade unionist. And um, in fact, she's one of 16 people who has who have been arrested and who who are pre presently now in jail. And they've all been in jail for over two years without a trial. We have in, in we have here the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which is used by the by the state to suppress any form of resistance, whether it is uh, worker struggles, whether it is uh, struggles of the peasants, struggles of farmers. It's something that has been widely used across, and it's in fact it has been widely used against uh, members of the Muslim community to bring about uh, this form of uh, divide. So it's something that we need to be very uh, to be acutely aware of that uh, that there are that, that the form of repression that is uh, that is there is is very very severe and um, we have the uh, national uh, uh, there is a, a special agency that is set up which is which forms directly under the central government called the national investigating agency which looks at uh, various laws and whose powers has have uh, are, are i mean and are extremely unbridled to say the least so I think in terms of the kind of repression that is uh, that that one is seeing, where the state is actually using its uh, its uh, its police powers to come down very heavily on people who who speak out in any form and uh, label them as terrorists. The, um, the there is also the I this um, there is also this thing that's being spread about where uh, people who who dissent are termed uh, uh, urban naxals and naxals is going back to naxalbari where uh, you know where we we saw uh, the, the incredible kind of uh, movement that took place and where so people anybody who dissents anybody who disagrees is just termed an urban naxal and um, and this is in, in so much so that it's become part of uh, uh, of uh, vocabulary and so i think the uh, one is in terms of the repression of the state and the other is in terms of the uh, manner in which the state is actually uh, creating this narrative of uh, anybody who resists anybody who dissents as being uh, unpatriotic or anti-national which is uh, which is i mean which is which is like which is something that uh, and as an authoritarian government is, is is something that one can very clearly see and as we going forward, I think it's something that we must be uh, uh, acutely aware of and uh, and be ready to kind of uh, take on in that sense. The um, uh, other question that you asked in terms of uh, what these changes mean for women workers and home workers, uh, one thing that we need to see is that the these codes really uh, hit the unorganized sector. I mean, what they do is they try the small organized sector that there is they try to weaken that and push as many as possible uh, as many workers as possible outside from the organized sector into the unorganized sector and those workers in the organized sector um it uh, puts them in far more vulnerable situations and the reason i mention this is that 95 percent of the women workforce is in the unorganized sector so when you are when when you so whether it is your whether it is workers on contract basis whether it's workers on casual uh, whether it's casual workers whether it's home based workers self employed workers a large number of workforce um, of the women workforce is actually in the unorganized sector one that is uh, already very very vulnerable and uh, the various changes that are being brought in would have a uh, like it has an impact on um, on all workers, women workers are especially affected because of the large number of workers, because they, they are in large numbers in this already vulnerable state. So, although there has been some talk, uh, and and you know the the uh, code on uh, social security, they say that it uh, broadens the ambit of uh, of workers in the unorganized workforce and brings more people within some form of social security. What it actually does is it actually pushes workers from who would otherwise have been in the organized sector into the unorganized sector and really takes away whatever little benefits that previously was there. So in that way, whether it is women workers, whether it is Dalit workers, um, they are all in the at the receiving end of this entire thing because they were, they were already been they were they were the ones who were already in a vulnerable situation. Just to conclude this, uh, uh, I, uh, the migrant workers crisis that we saw during the pandemic, and um, 
uh, uh, during the lockdown was is very telling on in in terms of what uh, in terms of the uh, reality of the of the unorganized workforce and large number of them were in fact uh, women large number of them were in fact from dalit communities so i think uh, what these courts do is push these people in a far worse situation far worse situation than they were so uh, the there is a very uh, there is definitely a, a very serious impact on on women workers and uh, and workers who are otherwise in vulnerable communities thank you thank you as well uh, <clears throat> uh, i think there are still a number of questions from the audience to the different uh, comrades and speakers uh, i would basically uh, and i have tried to collect them in a way that uh, there are some which are addressed uh, on the situation in india others on this more on the situation in germany um, and uh, obviously uh, if uh, I just read uh, uh, some of them out uh, and then maybe uh, you can uh, um, chip in to answer them. Uh, the first question I got here was, uh, my question, I read it out, is uh, from a, uh, somebody who contributed on the chat. My question is regarding the working condition uh, <coughs> as in... Uh, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, but both concerning domestic workers as well as migrant workers. Uh, considering broadly the attack on human rights in Jammu and Kashmir and what would be the changes in labor laws meaning for those. Uh, you can see it also here in the, uh, the chat function. And also there was a question raised, which is maybe also a question for a final round already. Um, uh, Uh, will one day general strike be enough to repeal the attack? Uh, and um, if not, uh, uh, what debates are in the trade unions uh, about what needs to happen if that's not uh, uh, the case? Um, and then there's also a question which I think was partially already answered. How would you analyze changes to labor laws in the context of the G EGB's uh, 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 agenda? So I think that was partially uh, addressed. Uh, but I think if the, because I just see that we have to wind up in the next 10 minutes to come to a final round, because <clears throat> we already are uh, almost two hours on. Um, so if it would be good if maybe these questions could be addressed in the final round by speakers. I also read out uh, two more, I think, which are well, three more, which are dealing uh, with uh, global or also German uh, specific issues. The first one is considering the tremendous efforts of the Indian working class by the new laws and their long term effects on the global workforce. Do such national, national attacks not warrant uh, for political strike action in countries like Germany um, to fight such attacks? What can we do uh, to make German unions more competitive in this regard? Uh, I think that's an, obviously an important one and uh, not an easy one. Uh, how to, and second one, How to convince the labor aristocrats, example, software developers, I mean, that may happen for Germany and, and India, that they have more in common with the construction worker than they do with the likes on Elon Musk and London Nilekani, uh, uh, I guess which is an Indian capitalist uh, <coughs> uh, so far. And finally, What is the role of unions in the global north, which Lenin called the wage labor aristocracy towards informal economies like those in the subcontinent? The question I think we probably have addressed already a bit, but which would be, I think, quite good if you could take it up in the last round. I think uh, just to make sure if uh, that uh, <coughs> we, we need to, I think, have got another 20, 30 minutes to go uh, on the stream. Uh, so if the 
speakers in the last round could confine themselves to four or five minutes so that everybody can make their final contribution. I hope I haven't forgotten any of the questions from the chat. Uh, if so, I'm sorry for that. Maybe this can be addressed when at the end informally. Uh, and uh, in the same uh, row of speakers as before, I would ask uh, <coughs> Comrade uh, Sindhu to uh, start with her final contribution. So, uh, one question I would like to answer uh, means I comment on that about the Jammu and Kashmir. So, recently I have been to uh, Jammu and Kashmir. It's a very uh, terrible situation there. More than one year, they have been in total uh, lockdown or a lockup. And uh, the there is no work, there is no income, that uh, it's a terrible situation. Uh, earlier, there was no internet, though no telephone, that uh, everybody knows that situation. And now also, this situation is uh, getting worsened. The working, there is job losses, there is income loss, everything is there. In addition to that, this is the drastic change in the um, land uh, loss that uh, uh, made recently earlier it was declared and recently it has made into a law that it is going to have a very big impact both financially and also in in uh, having an environment impact uh, it will be having so this is a very uh, serious critical situation and where there also there is resistance of the working class the workers are all there uh, even in spite of all this situation they are also trying to get uh, mobilized and uh, having actions and even strikes so even uh, on 26th also there will be action in jammu and kashmir and uh, uh, to uh, wind up uh, this uh, to summing up what uh, we have been discussing in the last round uh, once again i would like to thank the uh, German working class and the organizers uh, of uh, Berlin for India also and the uh, trade union colleagues. And here, uh, somebody has asked that whether this is a one strike which is going to um, make such a, any impact. Here, uh, as earlier also, I said that with all the limitations of the very means uh, uh, vast ma majority of the working class is still unorganized. But we can see in the last uh, general strike, there was there was 25 crores for people. That means 250 million workers participating in that. The total membership of the uh, trade unions together will be around uh, three, four crores or uh, means even uh, around uh, 10 to 15 percent of that who those who are participated in the general strike. So this is showing us the uh, capacity, the potential of the uh, trade union movement to reach out to the people. And this is the uh, estimate given by the mainstream media. So there is a potential and there is a political atmosphere. There is uh, an atmosphere coming up where this general strike will be a starting point of much more militant and much more uh, active struggles in the coming days so we will be all uh, and of course that international solidarity actions and support also is very much necessary and uh, i think that the same day there is a, a strike going to be happening in greece as well so this there is uh, coming days hopefully we will be coming up with uh, means a much more counter attack on the capitalist system and it can be developed and here crucial question of the working class and the uh, peasantry coming together we have uh, for uh, advanced one step forward this has to be consolidated and this has to be further strengthened to make the uh, uh, society and this class as ca class conscious so uh, this is going to be a big challenge and uh, very uh, hopefully we are looking forward and once again i thank you and 
um, uh, extend my revolutionary greetings. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, well, our greetings and our revolutionary greetings also to comrades in India. Next speaker will be uh, Matthias uh, and also try to confine yourself to four, five minutes like uh, comrade did before. Yeah, I will try to speak to the question how to raise solidarity between uh, IT developer and the uh, construction worker or garment worker. Uh, I think the trade union activity, basic activity, um, as it was described by Michael, is very necessary, for example, if there is the chance that workers in different countries can understand how their situation is linked and linked also by the uh, very concrete attacks of the employers. Um, just as the same as uh, there are big international movements now of uh, women fighting against uh, sexual harassment or um, uh, uh, people of color against um, discrimination. And uh, such movements have uh, developed on the mere understanding of seeing people in the same situation fighting. Uh, but of course, that is... And that is necessary, and we should all use uh, every situation to develop develop uh, develop solidarity in these questions. But it will not be enough. What we have seen today is practically that the situation in two quite different countries, Germany and India, that the last remnants of a sort of national uh, security that, that goes back to the strategy of the given bourgeoisie in Germany on feeding a labor aristocracy on the benefits of high exports, in India of isolating the country for a very long period, which broke up 30 years ago, and developing an own industry which also gives place for trade unions, that these, so to say, uh, contracts, social contracts are ending, are put in question by the fundamental global crisis of capitalism. And in the end, uh, we need an understanding of um, people fighting against uh, exploitation and oppression that this needs a global unified answer of uh, against capitalism and that any concepts of a social capitalism or a national capitalism or whatever, or by the way, a national socialism, are dead ends in, in a global world um, where all problems are linked together. So uh, I think um, not only as trade unionists, also as left activists, we we need to to link the, these uh, politic with these political fights and uh, develop an under common understanding for an international struggle and a new international. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Gautam Modi. Yeah, you know, uh, I'll start with Jammu and Kashmir in a way uh, where I left off. Jammu and Kashmir, you know, represents in a, in a sense um, really the extreme of today's political situation. It's the, it, it, it really is where a regressive authoritarian regime has pushed people to the extremity where the state has been reduced to actually the symbol of the other uh, uh, in terms of uh, people of the Islamic faith, um, People close to Pakistan, uh, which is which is the permanent enemy um, in the rise of of him. Um, uh, there are no rights there, so there's no question of uh, worker rights. Um, it's it's uh, it's a, a society that's been wrenched, as it were. And I think the challenge for the Indian working class is uh, how it's able to communicate solidarity, and that's a task we're all engaged in. Uh, uh, but it's 
a, a task that still requires many, many steps to climb. Uh, you know, the, the task before the working class, and that's not just for the Indian working class, is, um, is a long haul. It's work in progress. And um, I don't think it would be actually correct to give numbers as to how many people will strike on the 26th of November. More people are unemployed today than they have in, been in living memory in India. Uh, this is a question of political steps, political advance, and this is one step in that direction. Uh, Yes, uh, there is similarly a step about bringing about a convergence in all sections of the working class or working people, sections of um, um, the more advantaged, possibly white collar uh, IT workers, um, as they've been defined in one of the chats. This is part of that, part of that work in progress. But not all of the working class gets organized around working class issues. There are sections of the working class, if one looks back into the history of the mid, 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 and the third quarter of the 20th century, who were mobilized on political lines before they first came to actually identify themselves as working class. So uh, this part of the work in progress is really the question of, 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 of building consciousness and of building solidarity. Um, um, uh, and it's about learning. Um, I mean, if one thinks about the way uh, 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 unions emerged in, in, in India post the Second World War, where white collar workers and blue collar workers came together to form strong unions, um, and today it's very difficult outside of the public sector to find very large unions of white collar workers. Uh, there was a political moment, so to speak, in the 40s and the 50s. And um, that's in a, that was you know, part of the politicization of um, the, a section of the middle class, which identified very clearly as, 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 as when it came to work, that they were really working class. Uh, so I think we have lessons to learn from there. We have um, lessons to learn about how to uh, widen our movement. And I will really close um, with, um, with once again saying that it's through each other's struggles, it's through supporting each other, it's through standing by each other that we learn the most in the working class movement. Um, if the trade union is indeed, and I believe it is, a school of politics, then in that school, solidarity is the most educative moment. Um, but without the trade union, I do want to emphasize and emphasize very strongly that we cannot advance because the trade union is that, um, is that institution of struggle within the working class that actually draws um, 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 capital out in battle, measures it, and wages the and builds the ground to wage the war. And yes, that is the working class has to take the leadership in 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 in, in defeating capitalism. Uh, 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 without that defeat, uh, as we can see over the last century or so, we're then bound by the cycles of capitalism. And it was, it was famously said, capitalism this far is the most dynamic mode of production that we've seen. Our movement, work in progress it may be, but needs to acquire the dynamism to defeat the capitalist system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the next speaker uh, <clears throat> will be Michael. Um, and uh, then uh, Maitre, Michael. Okay. Um, yeah, I like to to try to answer the question: What 
unions in the global north should do or could do. Um, I think this applies for them, but also for unions in the global south, that we have to develop a trade union practice or, or trade union form of organizing. And I think there are examples on which we can build um, that include the issue of international solidarity and um, forming links with workers around the world into their everyday work. Because if it is an issue of the leadership or an issue that you do once or twice a year in a meeting or in a rally, then we will never be able to build that understanding of, uh, of power, of capitalism, of exploitation around the globe. And also then we will not be able to build the strategies that are needed to develop joint struggles and joint demands that we need to overcome capitalism. So I think one key issue would be to integrate in the question of how to build international solidarity and joint struggles um, into our everyday trade union work. And this would include um, yeah, developed demands or forms of bargaining on joint struggles or joint issues, but also learning from one another about organizing strategies, about how we live and how we work in order to build a class consciousness across borders, across different industries and along value chains. And I think this is like, I mean, you can always argue it's important, but I think now it's more important than ever because it's not only that the old social contract that Matthias spoke about um, has come to an end, but also in the current situation, I mean, I spoke about restructuring in the retail industry, but we have in our network similar experiences from other industries like metal industries or chemical industries that capital and the state, they are debating about how to reorganize um, the current model of capitalism we are living in. They are debating how our cities lo should look like, how our workplaces should look like, how work is organized, how we live, how mobility is organized. And these are the issues at stake at the moment in this, in this situation of crisis. And in order to not be victims of that reorganization of society, we need to come together and fight and develop own demands um, and own strategies and own ways of solidarity um, yeah, to make to make a world that we want to live in and not a world of capital. Thank you. Uh, Maitri uh, will be the final speaker. And uh, after that, there will be just a few announcements from the organizers. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'll uh, begin First, in respect of uh, the question in regard to Jammu and Kashmir, I just want to uh, add to what the other speakers have already said, that uh, we must recognize as a state under occupation, which has and it continues to be uh, repressed in in, in extremely, uh, very, very serious uh, uh, ways. The uh, it's, It is not only the state that has been... Uh, uh, that has been part of this, but in fact, the judicial system itself has been complicit in, in the manner in which this repression has taken place. And uh, the Indian working class uh, certainly owes it to stand in solidarity with the people of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. The, uh, insofar as the issue of the strike is concerned, I think uh, all of us do see the strike as part of a larger political process. Uh, but uh, the strike in itself also is something that is uh, certainly essential and certainly in, in that certainly has a uh, is a sort of message that is being sent over the last few years there have been strikes uh, against these the coming of these uh, of uh, the changing of these labor legislations and um, and uh, over several instances ca causing up to uh, about 18000 crore uh, loss to uh, loss to this so i think so the strike itself has has value and going forward also it is to be seen as part of a larger political process against the form of uh, uh, militant capitalism that is being enforced and um, and it's not only again and, and not only against that but it's it's also against the uh, uh, the, the uh, sort of the hindutva ideology that is being imposed and uh, the struggle forward i think is one certainly against by capitalism like everyone spoken and it is but it's also and it's also one to ensure and i think they go hand in hand the uh, 
the core values of democracy are protected and uh, uh, and which is why it's so important that that uh, uh, that it's not only if it's not only a struggle of workers it's not only it's not only the working class that is a uh, uh, that is part of this but the uh, largest struggle is one that would that is and 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 these are and this is something that efforts are that this is something that um, the um, that has happened that the workers farmers uh, peasant organizations and um, oppressed groups coming together to really fight against what is uh, what uh, we see as happening what we see happening so um, I, i would just like to end by saying that that the, i mean we are living in rather dark times and um, and it is the need of the hour and it is something that has been happening and that and that uh, one believes can will happen that um, we uh, continue to fight against this the, the working class various uh, oppressed sections come uh, continue to fight against this and um, and and against this kind of uh, assault that we are seeing thank you thank you to the organizers for uh, actually having organized this as well Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that uh, <clears throat> brings us to the end of our meeting. Uh, I want to thank all those, uh, the, the five uh, comrades uh, who contributed to the discussion uh, and uh, replied to the uh, uh, many questions which were raised, uh, brought in a lot of important aspects and insights. Uh, in the discussion. I hope this will not be, the, uh, this meeting will be a meeting uh, um, amongst many others where we can continue and deepen the discussion. Because I think one good thing we can say about this two hours and more is that there would be many more things which could be said, a number of points raised in the discussion which actually would deserve to be deepened, to be expanded on. Uh, and I don't think this is a bad thing, but rather shows that uh, the discussions and contributions brought a lot of uh, fruitful insights and points, which we all need to continue to discuss and work on. Uh, I think if you want to, the, one of the key uh, points to sum up the thing was the need for international solidarity, for coordinating our struggles, for actually going ahead as a global movement which uh, you know, learns from each other's experience, tries to improve the best practice, uh, but which also obviously links this struggle uh, against the, the current attacks to a struggle for different, for socialist, for classless society, for a society free of capitalist exploitation and social oppression. Um, but as I said in the beginning, the reason why we actually <coughs> organized this meeting is strongly related to the general strike in India on the 26th of November, in a few days' time, actually. Uh, this is a strike against the uh, attacks on labor rights uh, and labor code, but it is also for people outside India to inform them the day on um, the anniversary uh, um, where the Indian constitution was actually adopted on the 26th of 1950. And I think this, in a sense, symbolizes also the linking of social uh, struggles and the struggle for democratic and constitutional rights. And they get a uh, text on this. Uh, I also want to just briefly link up that the general strike by the trade unions, workers' movement, is also combined with mass protests by the farmers organizations on the 26th and 27th of November. And as a last note, we in Berlin, and I hope in other cities as well, we plan solidarity action and demonstration on the 26th. We are not uh, yet knowing exactly when to start and which route to go, but you can be sure we are going to take that action in solidarity with the comrades. Uh, <clears throat> and we will let you know via our Uh, uh, websites and media channel. Uh, thanks very much for your patience, for listening in so long, uh, and thanks very much in particular to the comrades in India, and uh, I want to again express our solidarity 
and much success on the 26th and beyond. Thank you.